Hi everyone and welcome to the Donut Docs Show, 60 minutes of unscripted Donut entertainment. As doctors of Donut, we prescribe healthy choices in Donut. I'm your host, Myra Wendo, with my co-hosts, Kim Soper and Luis Quintanilla. And I'd like to welcome today's guest, Greg Cannell, who's going to be presenting us about our eight ink dashboard uh, for home automation. So, Greg, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Greg Cannon. I, um, I'm native and live in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and I have been doing .NET for approximately 15 years, I would say, and um, for another 15 years plus before that, I have worked in the uh, IBM mid-range system coding RPG, so I've covered the gambit. Welcome to the show. It's a it's a pleasure to have you here. So, do we have our doc, our checkup doc lineup? We do. I'll be presenting that now. <laughs> All right. So, this week's checkup doc is actually a collection of documents. Um, I was very pleased to release a set of documents late last year. Um, this is our. Uh, IOT documentation hub. Um, it's not extremely deep yet. Uh, it is pretty new. We're working on expanding it. Uh, I've had some shifting priorities so far this, this year and haven't expanded it as much as we'd like, but that's kind of a call to action for the audience. If you've got some IOT experience um, in, in .NET and have some ideas to contribute um, uh, tutorials or, or other documentation to this, um, this set of documents, I would welcome the help. Um, I won't go into any great detail about what's here. I am going to hop real quick into this quick start. And this quick start requires a little piece of hardware for your Raspberry Pi called a sense hat. Hat stands for hardware attached on top. Uh, you get this little sense hat and follow the directions that I've given here to run this script. And this script will download a little project that builds and runs on the Raspberry Pi device and um, will uh, display the sensor data from the sense hat. Uh, it's a literally five minute process to get started with .NET IoT. Um, so with that, I, I, I invite contributions. I'm looking at you, Greg. Um, I invite <laughs> contributions to this, to this doc set and um, and that's really all we're going to talk about this week. Uh, so, I've been. I, sorry, yeah, go I ahead. Had a, sorry to cut you off there. I had a question. Now, sure. um, is the sense hat like pretty much plug and play, or are there diagrams in these docs that would help me understand how I could go about, you know, connecting it to my Raspberry Pi? Uh, yeah, so it is pretty much plug and play. So it's a device that you can get um, in various places around the internet. Uh, it is an official Raspberry Pi. Uh, peripheral. So this is what it looks like. Um, it's it's just a little sensor package with a little um, uh, eight by eight LED matrix. So um, it's got like an accelerometer, a gyroscope, a couple of different temperature sensors, a barometer, and some other stuff. Uh, so yeah, the idea is again, you just well, here's a yeah, there's an image of it attached to the top of the Raspberry Pi. You just plug it in, you run my script. And you'll have a program that displays all that sensor data and even gives you a little kind of interactive, um, not really game, but you know, a little a little cursor, uh, a yellow dot on a field of blue on that um, on that LED matrix. If you can move the, LED, uh, the, the yellow LED around, the yellow dot, you can move from LED to LED using the little joystick on it. Very cool. Yeah, wow. it's a lot of fun. How many do you have at home? <laughs> um, just in my desk. Uh, <laughs> here, here is one right now, actually. Um, and one thing I will recommend, actually, there is, um, there is a product, uh, I get mine from Amazon, but you can get it direct from the manufacturer or you know, there's other places on the internet. This, this black film that I've put on my sense hat, it's, uh, the name brand of this particular one is called light dims, but it's, it's a product that, uh, filters light from LEDs, right? So, you know, you've got all these different devices around your house that have super bright LEDs. You can slap this film on there and it, it filters the light and makes it quite a bit dimmer. Very cool. All right. I am super excited to get to this week's, um, uh, hallway track. So let's dive in. 
Let's do it. So, Cam, so, if there is one thing I wanted to say uh, before you, we get started. You, okay. You were, show, you were showing off your IoT docs, and um, I don't know, it may not have existed at the time that I started this project, but I was like, I've been doing .NET Framework. I'd never really done .NET Core, uh, certainly not any of that on the Raspberry Pi. So I scoured the internet in last summer searching for documents to get me sorted. And then when I saw your this one, the, the documents that you were just showing, mm -hmm. many of the things that I used was on that page. It has been captured awesome. in there. So I think that was uh, I think that's a very good resource for anybody that's wanting to do anything like this is your your page. Awesome. I am really glad to hear that. And th that actually brings me to um, you know the comments that I, I want to make introducing you know the context and setting the stage for the project you're going to show us today. Um, so I've talked about on this on this show that I have a little personal project uh, for my home automation system that drives it all running .NET. And I've talked about it in a couple of places. And I guess, uh, I guess Greg, you probably saw my talk at um, uh, 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 Code Palooza uh, in, in mm -hmm. uh, Louisville, right? Correct, yeah. Um, so he, Greg reached out to me late last year and, and said, Cam, I, I saw your talk and I want to show you this, this cool thing I did. And we sent a few emails back and forth and I just thought this thing was really awesome. And I'm like, Greg, do you know that I have a stream with my friends? And he said, no, I didn't know that. And I said, would you come on the stream? And he said, well, how many people watch the stream? And I said, probably more than you're comfortable with, but uh, don't worry about them. We're all, we have an awesome audience. They're all friendly. Code like nobody's watching. <laughs> yeah, there's there's, exactly. there's there's no judgment here at all. So, uh, Greg, please show Myra and and Luis this this thing that you've built because I think it's really awesome. Okay, um, I'm going to start with the hardware just to um, show you exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, let me bring this up. Can you can you guys see here? I'll maximize it. Can you see this e the e paper the the screen? Yep. Okay, and I'm sorry, my camera, I think right now, because nothing's on it, my camera's gonna try to uh, focus on it. It's having a little difficulty, but all right, it's just, it's a picture frame. And on the back of it, I have attached a Raspberry Pi. I've just glued it to it with Gorilla Glue. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I was sorry, just go gonna say gor Gorilla Glue is my adhesive of choice. for. Yes, it's either that or that like tape. This show is not sponsored by Gorilla Glue, but. <laughs> no. <laughs> And then, in, so like I said, that's just a cheap, regular picture frame. And uh, inside there, I've mounted this e-paper screen, which I've you know, got on the internet. And it's just, it is literally like 1.2 millimeters thick. There is like, it's like cardstock is sometimes thicker than this thing. And it, I, so I just, it's mounted in the frame, ribbon cable comes out to, it, 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 it came with a hat controller to plug right into the Raspberry Pi. And that's, that's, that's the hardware. There's really not a whole lot to it. Um, the software on the other hand, sorry about that. <laughs> um, the software that runs it is it starts with, there's a, uh, an e-paper driver that someone has made out there that lets you um, send bitmaps basically to it because this is these these screens are graphics only um, in, in the way they work and I, I can describe the e-paper a little bit to you but first I want to get to the actual there's a sample app uh, and sample um, image that this thing came with and I will show you so so um, we did have a question pop up from the audience already mm -hmm. um, the where, where was it uh, there it is. Already, somebody's like, "Okay, this thing is cool. Where can I? Where can I get it?" There is now. This particular screen is a, a WaveShare screen. There's WaveShare.com. They sell it. They sell a lot of different e screens um, with many different specifications. This screen is a um, uh, 7.5 inch monochrome, so it literally only does black and white. Uh, okay but I, I chose that one because it's got the size that I was looking for. And also because it has um, 
and it has a pretty decent refresh rate. E-paper screens, and okay, I'll, I'll get into explaining a little bit how they work in case I don't know how familiar you are. But sure, I'm that. not. I'm not at all. So <laughs> you can just. So, so you typically the only place anybody's ever seen these things is on a Kindle or on some digital signage. Uh, it's not widely used outside of those, but it's it's picking up, and it has some different attributes. I would say things that you're not you wouldn't typically see with like LCD or anything like that. For instance, um, you've got these little particles of ink that's in the screen and they, it uses magnetic fields to move like black ink forward or, or in which pushes, I guess the white ink back. And then it uses, um, sorry about the autofocus here. And no then worries. it uses, um, the magnetic fields to reverse that. So it, it literally moves these dots forward and backwards on the, on the screen. The re result is that there's really not like any noticeable space between the dots. So you get a really crisp and clear display. Um, this, this one here in a seven and a half inch form is, um, has 800 by 640 resolution. So you get pretty good resolution on it. Um, but there are, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, have you had any experience with this display, like doing any kind of burn in or anything like that? Or, or does it seem? They don't burn in per se. Uh, interesting about these, because of the way that the dot, you know, the, the ink moves front and back in, the, in the, the display, you can actually, once the ink is moved, it stays there. You don't, they don't have to maintain a field to keep the, the ink there. So you can literally power the thing off and it shows you the last thing that was on it forever. Um, although there is some, I guess the, the, the ink sort of will drift over time. So after I think it's 24 hours, you're supposed to redraw the screen, but there's really no, no burn in per se. Um, so David, um, our, our, our uh, other host, uh, was asking you know, to, if we could define burn-in. Um, so just for audience members who might not be familiar with the concept of burn-in, um, certain types of displays with static images will uh, hold on to that static image within the, um, within the material of whatever the display is, and you'll always kind of see that on the background. So like... I'm a I'm a Gen Xer. When I was when I was a kid, it was uh, you know I would go over to you know relatives' house who had a, had like a pr projection TV, and oh no 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 don't plug your video games into that projection TV because that's gonna you know put up like the HUD or whatever on on your game and burn in that 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 information on the screen. Um, modern displays, modern like um, LCD monitors don't so much have a problem with that. They can but it's it's actually pretty rare um and uh plasma displays are pretty vulnerable to it um organic leds are vulnerable to it um but not e-ink <clears throat> yeah I, I, like i said there i don't believe there's really any any type of issue there with e-ink um although it there is a limit to how much the screen can be refreshed on them and the limit is a million which is really a pretty decent um number if you think about it um no oh, i see a, a question has come up about refresh rate this particular screen because it's on a hat controller um a t you know it, it's a it a, it's on the it's it's through the spi interface on the raspberry pi it doesn't have the greatest bandwidth and honestly i don't know what the bandwidth is on those but uh, a, a full display on this is about 64K of data, and it takes it about five seconds to update. Um, so, so you're not doing a lot of real-time data? Yeah. It, it, I'm, I'm, it, I mean, like, like, like real, when I say real-time, I mean, like, sub-second. I mean, right. Yeah, there but, is some of the displays support partial refresh where you can update individual sections of the screen, and those can be updated sub-second, but generally a whole screen refresh it's it's going to take time like uh, one of the other there is a four color driver um along with and i'm sure there are other drivers but i'm, I'm only looking at the the ones that i've played with there's a four color screen and driver as well that uh, is available in uh dot net it's actually the same 
SIM driver set that I'm using. And uh, that screen is a, has a 600 uh, by 400 or something like that resolution, but it's four color. So there's, um, it's red, it's black, white, red, and gray. And that one takes about 30 seconds to update. Wow. So yeah, yeah, I was going to say that even at, at a few seconds, right? It's not too bad compared. I've seen some some cases where it literally takes minutes to do a whole screen refresh. So at a few seconds, it's not it's not too bad. Right. Uh, and that's another reason why I chose this particular one is you literally have like a five. I think the best I've been able to get in my trial runs is a five point five second refresh rate, which I'm fine with. It, it works perfect for this project. You don't you don't want to treat it like an LCD. Mm -hmm. uh, display and expect real time data. But if you're using it for a dashboard, generally you don't need up to the second information up to the minute is fine up to the five minutes, something like that. Right. So I was going to ask you like, what are kind of the use cases where you've seen, so you, you mentioned dashboards. So are there any other use cases that you've seen this kind of display being used? I've seen a lot of digital signage. Um, and it's the, because it does not, have to um, use power to maintain the display. Uh, a lot of these controllers in in digital signage, they will they will the controller will power up right to the screen. The controller powers down, and then it's virtually no power consumed. You can run this thing on a little bitty battery for months because there's you know there's nothing necessary to maintain the screen I, I again i'm not sure about the screens that they're using but on this one you're supposed to refresh it once a day mm -hmm. um but that still is not going to take a lot of power so that that works there also these things if you've ever used a kindle uh the a amazon kindle e-reader those mm -hmm. have um those you know the batteries on those things last for days and days of, of usage and uh, it's the same thing. They don't. They don't need power. Only on, they only use power to change the screen. So you said you said you said signage as a as a use case. So let, let's let's tease that out a little bit. So I could conceivably let, let's say I have a shop or something. I have uh, products for sale in my shop. I could like set these up like with each of my you know each of my items in my shop with like a price and whatever other information I want on there, and like I could just basically leave the screens powered off, but they're going to display that information and right. I could rig up some kind of a way to push new information to them at like an interval or, or on demand or something. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I've seen that in some um, chain department stores where they had small, very small little e-paper screens on the, on the shelves. Um, I don't, I imagine those are probably not connected. Those you probably actually physically have to plug into them or walk over and beam something at it to change the, the display. But, um, yeah, that's, you could use that in many ways. Um, there are, there are screens of variety of specs. Like this particular screen is a $55 screen and that includes the hat controller. Now, so, are they, are they available with, uh, with touch screens? I'm not sure. That's very likely um i know that you can get full 1080p with hdmi port e-paper screens but those those are like you know 800 screens wow. and they yeah. but it probably quite possibly includes touch screen on them uh, i would imagine with that kind of specs they would have they would have that on there i was i was going to say along the lines of you know uh, low power consumption touch screens and things like that a while back there used to be a wearable pebble uh, which was powered using e-ink displays. And one of That's the great right. things about it, it was the fact that you could wear this thing for virtually forever and not really have to recharge it. So so there's even the in the wearable market, right, there's a lot of potential. For the I actually had one of those early on, and um, I charged that thing just because it felt like yeah, I've had it so long without charging it that I need to charge it. I never really ran out of power on that thing. Yep. It was pretty amazing. Um, so I have a little demo here. Like I said, this the yeah. driver, the driver that this uh, that I'm using has a, a little sample app that, uh, and all this app does is it opens a uh, it, it it opens a connection to the to the device, initializes it, and then sends um, a bitmap to it, and then closes out. Uh, but that gives you an idea. Since this thing is like I said, it's entirely graphical. You you can only send entire screens to it that uh, works 
And hopefully once I put something on the screen and the camera will stop trying to focus. So here, I will run this app. And then you'll see what it looks like. There, that was it. That was it updating. Huh. Now, because this is a black and white screen, you know, uh, you don't really get the reds. This this driver dithers the grays, so you do get a semblance of gray, but it is strictly black and white. Right. And um, and this, uh, just to confirm, this is uh, like a JPEG or a PNG, some sort of image that you're displaying here. It is. It is a PNG. Yes. Okay. So. Um, so basically I built on that. I, um, the project here takes a, um, a ski -a sharp canvas and bitmap and, um, accepts changes to it, such as, well, I'm gonna try my camera here, accepts changes to it, um, in the form of text and images and will apply it to the canvas and then send the bitmap to the screen. And it, okay. um, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, so this is what you meant earlier when you said you can't do like text or whatever. So you have to render text as a bitmap and, and the, oh, right, okay. That's that's correct. So it's all, I'm, 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 I'm use, using Skiashar for that and which is a, a great, um, so, a great so, option, I believe, I'm sorry. So I was just gonna say, so what's the code that look like to, to display that? Funny you should ask. I, I thought <laughs> that might be where you're going. <laughs> so, um, uh, let me collapse some things down here. So the project has, I have four applications within the project. The, uh, there is an API. Well, there's an API, which, uh, I am using the, um, swashbuckle, um, API, which if you guys ever have to do any type of more than basic rest interface uh, applicate you know have make a rest interface swashbuckle is absolutely amazing for that because i was when i started this i was going to write my own um, simple rest interface to accept these commands and draw them on the screen until i found swashbuckle and then i was not going to reinvent the wheel when they've done such a great job For and sure. then and then i have a within the sorry collapse this out i have a common which is not really an application it's just all of the the libraries that are being used uh, inside it has a uh, a service for rendering there it goes and in this service is the one that it, that holds the the ski -a sharp canvas and the bitmaps and everything that it um it accepts all the commands to actually this is the the one that renders on there and then um, there is a console app which allows you to send the commands if you want to via uh, you know Windows console on the Raspberry Pi. However you however you want to, you can do it local. You can do it remote. It will it will send the REST commands as well, so you can script them if you need to do any type of uh, batching of commands. And then uh, I have a desktop viewer which will let you remotely access. The, and view the the ski sharp, which we'll get to later. The the, the ski at canvas. Um, but in the, the the renderer, I actually have. I'll find this. Um, like here, I'm, I'm, this is an add an image where it just simply takes a an an, an SK bitmap and draws it on the canvas, and it gets it gets the image from the user I, let's let's get to the uh the actual api and this might make a lot more sense okay so i've seen a lot of projects out there that use the paper screens but they had a very specific usage of them for instance um there's some out there that will do um like to-do lists and calendars and things like that and that's it's and they look absolutely amazing and i'm sure they do the job well but it, for some reason it i wanted something that was a lot more flexible i suppose you could say something that wasn't constrained to just one person's idea of how they wanted to use it and this is obviously taking a little longer i'm guessing because of the load of the sharing software here 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and to clarify uh, that statement there, do uh, you mean in the sense that you're building, you could build th this API that you provided or fork it and then sort of adopt it to, or adapt it to your particular use case? Is that what you're referring to? That is correct, but more specifically, I, my intent was to have this whole, um, this whole project, everything that you're gonna see here with the e-paper device, that it's it's to be like pretty much just generic and um, however you wanted to use it, you can you know, use it as you see fit. So right. here's, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no go ahead, no, no I, I, I. So this thing, I, I don't define, you know, how anything looks, that's all up to the end user and through this REST interface. So they have, here's all the commands that are available. Um, there are, you could you could draw an image on the screen. Um, now, now did, did you define this API surface? I, I defined the API, yes, um, okay. but not, but I'm using Swashbuckle to uh, present it. Basically. Right, 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 yep. Swashbuckle, yeah, we, Support. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was just gonna say. I think, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. I, I don't get too much into the ASP.NET side of things lately. But uh, so I'm looking at Myra and Luis. Isn't Swashbuckle? Isn't like that like part of the Web API template in .NET five now? I believe so. And I okay. pasted a link into the chat here on how you can get started with ASP.NET and Swashbuckle. Oh, I, yep. I absolutely recommend it. I was amazed at how flexible this thing is. Um, so I have defined this, um, the actual API and the way Swashbuckle works is, is this is open API compliant. So if you, you had anything that was any client that knows how to talk open API, it can communicate with Swashbuckle. It can pull down the JSON of the, um, the schema. And, and I guess that allows you to bind to it more, um, uh, natively, but, um, I also, am, uh, but I'm particularly using it because you don't need to have a client that's open API compliant. You can have anything that could send an HTTP put or uh, uh, with a, a JSON document to these, um, to these URLs and it will render or alter the screen based on what's been sent to it. Right. So here, like I said, there's, here's one for image. Um, it's, and here's a simple, it, it, what the JSON document looks like. You use your X and Y coordinates, your file name, and, um, it will draw the image that you, uh, that's here in this folder on the screen. Um, gotcha. on, there on is, these, sorry to interrupt you there. Uh, on these screens, do the X, Y coordinates work the same way that they do on the web where they start in the top left top, corner? Top left. Okay. Yeah. And then there is a uh, a draw, which is is different in that it it doesn't take a file name, it takes the x y coordinates, uh, width and height, and then allows you to to uh, provide SVG commands. So not an entire SVG image, but the individual like in this case, you see draw a circle, add this text to it, and I will I will uh, demonstrate that. Let me uh, let me start my application up. <clears throat> now this start, you'll see it. So that was the, um, the application actually running on the, the Raspberry Pi. Okay. Now, if I come over here, and within the UI, I execute. Uh, so here's a an option to actually try to send this uh, JSON document. I'm just going to cut and paste this sample here. I'm I'm curious. So when you send commands to um let's say they were to send multiple requests or multiple commands, how does the rendering or the renderer handle that? Is it just like the API processes sort of as the requests come in or is there some other way that it handles concurrent requests? 
It just it's as they as they come in. Yes, um, there is no. It's just full async at that point. Um, all right, so I'm going to execute this. And as you'll see here, it's, it has some colors. It has green in it. And this is obviously not going to render the green as green. Um, but nonetheless, you can still see. And you can click the hide um, button on that stream. Uh, here if you want to. Thank you. Want to make that go away. Thank you. And you good here. Everything worked well. Actually, I should go back here and make sure this thing. Okay. And my screen just went blank. Okay. <laughs> I think my uh, my desktop got overloaded here. I have no idea what's going on on my desktop. So we could. I think we could still see it. Yep. Okay. Here it goes. It's back. Yeah. I think it might be. Uh, oh. There we go. It was. Uh, yeah, we're streaming. So like it gets the processes get very slow on your machine. Yeah, and don't don't feel bad when we had our, our early episodes of this show when we were bottlenecked on my machine doing all the doing all the streaming. Um, we had my internet go out. We had my machine lock up. We had my machine blue screen. <laughs> Some of those early shows are are hard to watch. All right. I just realized that I am using the wrong. This is my local host. <laughs> I, this, I'm actually running this project within um, Visual Studio, and that's what it just rendered to, which well, I'll go ahead and show you that. This will run fully in Visual Studio. You just can't go to an e-paper screen. Mm -hmm. Oh, gotcha. But as, as, I, as you saw, I just sent a draw command. I can actually come here and look at what the canvas is like. Oh, really? How's that? Oh, that's oh, that's wow. cool. So <laughs> your so your, your so your API implements the 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 rendered image as a as a GET request, right? Cool. You have the option to do that, and I'm going to clear this one. So this allows me to clear the screen. There are clocks is an option. I realized uh, early on that. Anybody using this may very well want a clock on these and uh, requiring an external dependency to continuously send clock information was probably not a good idea. Mm -hmm. So I included uh, a clock feature where instead of instead of having to tell it every minute how to render the clock, you just tell it at one point, here's what I want the clock to look like. And it does it. Okay. I, I am going to go back to this. So, so yeah, I was gonna. My next question was gonna be. So, so this this API is probably running on your your Pi too, right? That's correct, and that's what I intended to show you. <laughs> well, this is the this is it on the Pi. And if I pull up this screen, it's just going to show a blank, which is which matches what you see on the screen itself. Okay. Now, if I come in here and I do a draw, and again, you don't have to use this interface. This is really for for testing and development. Mm -hmm. Once you have your 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 commands worked out like you want it. Um, you should be able to, anything on the network should be able to send these rest commands to this screen to, uh, to render. So there it comes back. It shows the, uh, 202 it, it completed. Now, if I come back here and execute this, you'll see it's on there. And if I look at the screen there, it's on there. Wow. Yeah. We need sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
I need, that, I, need, I need to have that one sound. Well, the last time I tried that, you remember I screwed up the audio and we ended up with three doors down playing. No. Uh, <laughs> so again, I, um, I, I could sit here and do some of these through the interface, but it's really going to be a bit painful because uh, this is really meant for testing, not for general everyday use. Right. But so I, I have. Show. Yeah, that showed how fast uh, the rendering happens on the screen, right? Like it was literally a few seconds. Here, I will. I will. I'm going to hit clear. Did I execute? Yeah, it's executing. And then you'll see there's a there's some delays within the software to give commands time to sort of pile up so it doesn't draw the, the screen too many times. And that cleared the screen. Um, like I said, I can do it in about five and a half seconds, but I'm intentionally waiting for other commands in case there are some. So as I a home audit, uh, go ahead, Luis. I my, muted myself. I was going to say, so speaking of dashboards, which I think you might be showing us next, uh, is there a dashboard to, let's say you have multiple commands, like you said, that are stacked up waiting to render, uh, that you could either cancel them or or stop them from rendering at, at some point or managing them? There, there is no, are you talking about within, well, within talking about queuing of the commands or I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think that that's what you were referring to, right? That, that you have built in a delay so that you allow enough commands to stack up to the, then, you know, process them in a, you know, it doesn't sort of clog up your service. Right. But the way um, they stack up, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. The way they stack up is that they are, they are processed as they are received. So as soon as uh, a, a, a draw or a text command comes in, they're, they're rendered on the SCIA canvas, on the bitmap. Mm -hmm. And then put it um, on the e-ink the e um, service, this one that actually takes the uh, the bitmap and sends it to the, the, the screen. It waits for five seconds to make sure there aren't any others because you may, this may be a, a flurry of activity sending, you know, several things that you want to draw. So you don't want to, you don't want to redraw the screen 20 times in a minute because there were multiple commands. So it waits for, um, I guess five seconds of no activity and then goes ahead and draws everything. So, so basically you've got, so you've got like, a, a canvas abstraction or, or something like that and and you're saying that you're going to draw you you've got it rigged up in such a way that the api gets a um gets a command to draw a circle and it gets a command to draw a rectangle and it gets command to draw an ellipse but you don't actually render it all until you get no more draw commands for a certain period of time not exactly no it actually renders them immediately but it doesn't send what it rendered to the e-paper screen <laughs> right gotcha okay gotcha um, and I can I can demonstrate that a, a little bit better uh, in a bit, but I want to show you some of these. I have a couple of scripts here, and I'm just verifying that I didn't break anything earlier. <laughs> um, okay, we're good. So um, I'm going to bring it in here, and it should be. You can see this okay. Um, and and in the the script will actually it's just a batch file and you can actually see what it commands it sends. Uh, I'm not hiding any of those just to show you that there's really not too much to it. But sends a draw command which is clearing a. Um, Wow, this is really slow. It's clearing an area of the screen uh, for the text, and then it sends the actual text. And then you will see there it's rendering it, or it's uh, displaying it. There. Yay. <laughs> That's so cool. And, so my uh, my mind sorry. is lighting up with with possibilities <laughs> of where I can put these in the house and and what information I can put on them. And, and th that is one of the things is that yes, anything on the network can send these commands to the screen, um, but it wouldn't have to be any one device. You could sort of divvy out real estate on the screen and say this area I want to you know I'm going to get results from 
my uh, rib smoker. <laughs> and in this area, I'm going to get results from my, uh, my home automation system, that sort of thing. It, it's, it's you're in control to how this looks. Right. So essentially you're saying you can, you can split it up into like pains or whatever. Right. However, however you want to do it. And it, again, it's, there's, there is no virtual segregation. It's just real estate on the screen. You're, 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 you're setting X, Y coordinates. If you go back here and look at the script, um, it just sent these, here's the X, Y coordinates. This is, um, my vertical, um, justification is what that setting is. And again, it's all in the rest document, which I'll show you. Here's the text that it sent. Here's the font that it used, font size, font weight, and color. And that, if you go and you look at the, um, the actual, um, document. So here's an, you know, a sample document that's in the text. And over here, another thing that I love about, um, about Swashbuckle is that you can use the XML comments within the program to totally define the schema. So this is all of the parameters that's in the JSON document. And um, I've got default values, you know, examples, descriptions on what it is. This is, this is something that Swashbuckle pulls from the XML um, comments within the, within the code. And I'll actually show you that. Awesome. So over here, um, the, the render actions. So these are the ones, let me stop debug here so you can see more of the screen. So here are the, uh, here, I'll go down to te uh, text, which is what we were just looking at. So I'm able to describe it takes these XML comments right here and uses it in the schema um, specifically by, um, okay. We close my, I close my browser when I, when I shut down. Anyway, the, the API interface has all of this information without me having to document it beyond mm -hmm. what you see here. And also I am using, go back to the command line within the, uh, within the console app, um, it's pulling this as well. I'm using a, another product. Um, so I have online help. It's, it's the same. It's the same information. Um, what what oh, what nice. project what project is that? Because I could really use that. The 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 project yeah, yeah. that does the yeah. Because I'm seeing yeah. he has like some option attributes there, so it's there. probably pulling. So it, from yeah, there. it's pulling that. That is called. Um, it's this one. McMaster extensions command utilities that I'm using. Oh, yep, yep. I can vaguely remember Scott Addy telling me about that, and I filed it away and then forgot about it. It is it is really good. And in this case, this actually allowed me to make in, um, multiple commands within the command. So as you saw here, um, these are the these are the commands within within them. I have all of the options so you don't have to just have one level where you have one command and its options and then you have to make another one in this case i actually set it up where you have all of these different commands and they each have their own options this is just the options for text that's pretty great i gotta, and, I gotta and, find that project and that is very easy to do here in the console um you set up classes for the commands and, or the subcommands in this case. And there's really not a lot to this, to the console lab. That's it. Very cool. So it, it's pulling everything from the classes, from the class for the, the details on the command. 
And then I have, you know, code elsewhere that actually sends the, the JSON document away, of course. Of course. But, yeah. So we're at a quarter to the hour, <laughs> and I, I, I don't, I don't want to rush you, but I know there's a practical application of this project. There that in, absolutely in, in, is in your house that I really want to see because it's up my alley. Yes. <laughs> so, and I will show that right now. So I have over here Habitat, and. Um, so for our viewers who haven't heard me go on and on and on about IoT and home automation and stuff like that, what's Hubitat? Hubitat is a uh, home automation hub. There's a lot of different ones out there. Wink, um, the, what's the Samsung Smart one? Smart Things. Smart Things. Yeah, this is this is another one. Um, I have I've really latched onto this. Thank you, Cam, for pointing me to this in your talk. Um, it's very, very programmable. It is not cloud-based, so there's a lot of more security, that sort of thing. I'm not affiliated with them, so I'm not trying to sell a product that, that uh, I have a stake and in. Here, here's how unaffiliated I am with them. I, I gave that talk that you saw, and I, I called the product the wrong thing. I keep calling it the wrong thing. The company name is Hubitat, but the product, and I think it's, I think, I think I'm getting it right this time. It's called Elevate. But oh, Hubitat call, Elevate. Yes. Yeah, I keep calling it Elevation, and I've had, I've had viewers reach out to me. And they're like, you, you're, you're, you're not a big fan of this product. You keep getting the name wrong. I'm like, well, you know, I only have so much room in my head for names and things like that. It, you 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 call it when you call it at home, and it becomes Hubitat. So. <laughs> Um, so I have set up a virtual device here in Hubitat that um, sends all of those commands that you saw um, through through the rest. And I am going to execute a clear here just to start fresh. Okay, so 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 to conceptualize this real quick, so what you've what you've done here is you've in in the Hubitat code you've created a a, a device abstraction, right? Like a like a uh, a device driver, basically that you can you can poke at and and invoke methods on that device. Exactly. Yes. It okay. all this does is it takes these parameters, wraps them up into a uh, the the appropriate JSON document, and uh, sends it to the uh, swashbuckle. So, so then the advantage to doing this is that you've ex basically exposed your API in Hubitat's environment, so other I stuff have. in Hubitat can can interact with it, right? That's right. That's right. Okay. And um, and um, I guess to expand on the automation piece, since you now can interact through Hubitat and manage through Hubitat, uh, could you do then some sort of if this then that type of thing, where like when I walk into my home, have my you know, display, display, welcome, you know, whatever, right? Absolutely. Um, I, I, I have it where it shows me thermostat information, uh, temperature in a room information, um, that sort of thing. I have a little sample here. There is this okay. little Z-Wave Z controller that I have. Um, you, you push buttons and it executes a command. This could be anything. This could be a door sensor. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be this push button controller. This was just easy for me to, to, to implement for demonstration purposes. And I have, it's this one here, button, this remote button, button number seven. If I push button number seven, it sends these commands. And then this is just a rule. You can set up any of these rules. Um, you're being very complicated. Uh, as you said, if you walk in the door, do this sort of thing. So I will pull this up here and I'm going to hit a button. And when I click button number seven, should eventually, again, there's a little bit of a delay uh, before it even starts rendering there. Yeah, look Perfect. at that. Nice. And I have another uh, command here set up. Um, in a different one, but yes, this could be this could be anything, not just you know text. You can draw uh, images, icons, that sort of thing. There, that that's an example, and this is all based on button pushes. Here, that it's firing these rules that you saw. There's one more. So again, that's, it, that goes back to what you were just asking about rules. This is entirely based on these rules in here. Um, 
in this case, how I'm doing it now. Wow, uh, the speed here astounds me <laughs> how slow it's gotten. Um, I have also set up an application that is, let me go back and clear the screen, which is in, in Hubitat, it just allows you to um, automate with programs written in Groovy. Yeah, so just to fill in the, the, the gap there a, a little bit for folks who, who aren't familiar with the, the programming interface in, in Hubitat. So it, basically, Hubitat exposes all the different devices and stuff that you configure within their you know list of devices, exposes them all to their programming interface. So you can write um, code to interact with it in whatever way you want. It doesn't have to just be these the, this rules engine. Um, so what 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 Greg, I guess what you've done here is you've, um, since you've built this device, you've all your other programs out there can, can send whatever data whenever, right? So what, that's correct. What other, so you, you, you showed us the remote, what, what other kinds of things do you display on there? Do you have like oh. any, any type of like real time, like, um, you know, that my front door is unlocked or that kind of thing? Yes. And I'm waiting for this to draw. <laughs> I hope I didn't have a. Uh, so with some should M draw. with some ML.net, this could be so good. Says Janice The gears are already turning. So, yes. Yeah. I'm gonna get my log real quick to make sure I didn't have a failure. I started and it should have started drawing. Oh, you know what? It's going to take time. I just realized that. Uh, that didn't do it automatically. While, while that's happening, um, maybe you might or may not be able to show this. Um, but so you showed that you're able to interface through this REST API, and you also have the console application that you can send commands through. You can also do it through Hubitat. But I'm curious, what is actually talking to the e-ink display itself, telling it, hey, do these things, right? Like, like, is there some sort of a package or library that you're using to to handle the communication with uh, the actual e-ink display? Yeah, there that's is, something we didn't go into. There is this um, driver here um, that it's, oh, actually, I, just, I can't remember the name of the NuGet package. I'll just have to show it to you. There's a NuGet package out there that it has drivers for it. For the wave shared device that you yes, gotcha. There we go. And this is uh, .NET Core. I yes, it's yeah. .NET Core. Awesome. So this guy started it. Um, he he wrote it for one of the e -ink drivers. I one of the e -ink displays. I went out and wrote it. Uh, wrote a uh, separate an, an add on to use this particular driver because he I liked his framework. Um, oh, cool. But he, so, but, so you, so, so you, so you've helped publish this package. It's out on NuGet. Yes, he started it again. I'm just a contributor. I am. I, I, I can only take uh, credit for being able to communicate with this specific display. Right. Um, Still, that's but, that's that's that is. Yeah, I, I and the rest of the community, thank you, because I'm sure I'm going to be buying one of these and hacking on it very soon. And there is uh, this. This uses those drivers to send the uh, the information to the, the basically to send the the bitmap is what it is. It takes a a bitmap of the screen and sends it to the the driver for rendering. And my demo is falling apart here. Device. Well, what, what, while you're while you're talking through that, um, I am gonna share out your repo. Um, oh yes. So so Greg has published all of this stuff at the URL that I'm displaying on the screen right now. Um, the uh, uh, you can go and and grab his code and get your hands on one of these devices and a Raspberry Pi and start sending um, start sending data to an e-ink display around your house. Oh, look, we have something. Yes, there, so there's the information. This is weather information that it's pulled. Okay, now just pulled uh, 
the thermostat information from the house that that's uh, how temperature, humidity, that sort of thing. And that, oh, that awesome. this all came straight from Hubitat. And this is just my uh, prototype Hubitat application that's piecing these together. But it could be it could be anything. It, this could be server status on your network. It could be anything. It doesn't have to. You don't need the Hubitat elevation to send. All you have to do is be able to bottle up these commands, uh, the REST commands. So, so, so essentially, you've built a you've built the the API that runs on the Raspberry Pi that's connected to the Hat device, and you can send API. You know, you can send you know REST you know requests to it all day, and you have created a basically a Hubitat abstraction that you can um, wrap that in. That you can use Hubitat applications and send Hubitat Hubitat data to that abstraction, right? Right. Yeah. That's, gotcha. That's how that works. And so, but, but so you don't even have. Like I said, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to ask you. Did you? So before this project, have you ever had a, like a like a like a dedicated home automation dashboard? No, I have not. I know that's something that a lot of people in the community do. You know, they're like that the, they hang tablets up on the wall or I've seen some very, really fancy installations where they'll build like a like a in wall holder for their tablet and do like in wall power for it or right. you know dedicated devices. You know, the closest I have is I have an Amazon Echo Show, right, which has some little you all can hear the saw behind uh, underneath me, I'm sure. Uh it has some um the uh, the Echo Show has some kind of dashboard functionality built in, but it's not nearly as like customizable as what you've done here. Yes, that's and again, that's what I really wanted out of this was something that was completely open architecture, open, you know, any anything can send anything to this API and uh, render it. And one last thing, if we have time, I know we're running short, we're running low on time. Sure. Is um, I have this viewer here, which is a um, Avalonia. It does the get and pulls the pulls yeah. the rendered image I, off of it. Actually, no, it does, this does not do the get. This is oh. using, I, I've written another, um, there's another driver. There's the display driver, which sends the EE screen, but there's also a socket driver, which sends the data over a socket. And this, this will give me real time information. I see it at the moment anything happens before the ink is even rendered it. Oh, that's cool. I can cool. see this. And it's just a, it's just an experimental at this point, but this runs in windows. This runs on the raspberry Pi. You can, so you can put it on in X windows, uh, as well. Uh, it is also not limited to two colors. Well, that's handy. Very cool. Yeah. And we're seeing, we're seeing a conversation out in the, in the chat. Folks are excited. They've got ideas. I There's a ideas. lot of things. I think you probably just sold a few of these panels for somebody. They, they, <laughs> ought, to, they ought to cut you into a uh, ought to give you a cut. I should. I should totally get a get some sales from this company. Affiliated links. <laughs> so uh, as we're down to the last uh, last minute, was there any closing thoughts that you wanted to have, Greg, before we turn it over to Luis to to close the show for us? Uh, the only thing I wanted to say was this thing, you actually don't need an e-ink screen with this. You can run it with like the socket drivers and just have this thing. I have a little 13 inch uh, Raspberry Pi with built in screen that's touch screen. Uh, I can run it on that and see, use the viewer to see the information on it. Uh, and that's handy. In, X, in X windows. So, you know, and potentially this could be, you know, shown on other devices as well so like other, it could be like a like like like, like a universal dashboard canvas that you could put on like e-ink and lcd screens and whatever right cool well that was awesome greg thank you so much for coming to the show uh when we after we play out the credits i need you to hang on after the show because i need to get a screenshot for our website i forgot to do that before the show Okay. Um, with that, Luis, can you close out the show for us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of the website, uh, first of all, we want to thank everybody for watching the Dotting Doc show. We really appreciate you coming together and, and engaging with our guests and, of course, our guests for joining us as well. Um, if you want to check out this recording, maybe you want to look back at some of the things that were mentioned uh, or take a look at upcoming topics, uh, you can do so at the .NET Docs .deb website. Uh, and next week, you can tune in so we can, we'll be talking to uh, Samir Mansour about empowering accessible 811Y iOS and Android users to use your app. So make sure to uh, tune in next week for that. Thanks, folks. Take care. Thank you.